Good morning, everybody. How is everyone doing? That is amazing. Because usually I have to tell people, hello, good morning. This, I love the energy. So thank you all for coming. I feel totally excited and humbled to sit, stand in front of a room full of amazing women. How often does it happen in our industry, isn't it? So, before we get started, can we give one more round of applause for Women Tech Makers, the amazing organization that has brought us together. Thank you. Today I want to talk about building bridges. Building bridges has shaped me both professionally and personally, and I want to share with you my journey from a little rural town in India to where I stand here today. If each one of us takes a little moment to reflect, I'm sure we can all find that moment in time that shaped us. Can you take a moment to do that? Sometime very early on that had made a great impression on you. For me, it was my father walking back from an academic conference with a mechano set. My dad taught civil engineering for 35 years, and his specialty was soil mechanics. An expert in his field, he was constantly asked to come in to test the viability of big structures that were being built all around us in India. And so I grew up watching him with huge plans, looking at structures, mostly bridges, that looked big and magnificent. So holding this mechano set that I could build my own bridges seemed like the best gift in the whole world. Little did I realize at that time that the very act of a dad giving a six-year-old daughter a mechano set was actually remarkable not just for the little rural town in India, but anywhere in the world. And just like that, that moment told me that I could be anyone I wanted to be. I could build amazing things, dream big dreams, solve big problems. Does that make sense? But looking back, I realize that it was not just physical bridges that shaped who I was. My grandfather fought for Indian independence. He espoused the values of human rights, gender equality, and women's education very, very strongly. I never met him. He passed away before I was born. But the home that I was in embodied his values. All around me, I saw adults doing things that needed to get done rather than what was defined by gender. My aunts fixed electrical appliances, my dad sewed buttons, and everybody played a mean game of cricket. Do you know what cricket is? Yeah, and they were competitive. No, my aunts were like not any pushovers. They played a mean game of cricket. We had intense debates and discussions on everything from social topics to politics. My parents also built bridges. In our home, we had people from all walks of life, all faiths, every economic strata coming in and participating. I thought it was completely normal for my very spiritual mom to have a close friend who was an atheist. I thought it was completely normal for my mom to spend less time in the kitchen and more time reading and telling me that I should do the same, where all around me there were girl skills that were being taught. I thought it was completely normal for my aunts to pursue professional careers. All around me, stereotypes were being broken. I saw adults taking responsibility for what needed to get done, and more importantly, as really exhibiting true empathy. So let's take a moment to ask this question. Whose worldview 
are we shaping around us? Who's looking at us today? Is there a little girl or boy in your life that is looking to you for inspiration? And are we exhibiting the amazingness that's inside us? Breaking the stereotypes that tells girls they cannot do things. Breaking the stereotypes that tells boys that doing certain things is girly. What is our role? Take a moment to think about the people around you that could do with a little bit of inspiration for whom you could build a bridge from what is being defined on the outside to a better reality. Now, this is not all about altruistic, let's go save the world. What I discovered is that building bridges and this bridging mindset gives you negotiating superpowers. How many of you think that you are better at negotiating for others than yourself? Yeah, me too, right? Why is that? Why is that? There you are, passionately negotiating for your team, asking somebody to give your employee a raise, even maybe negotiating for a sibling to, to be able to go do something, but not for yourself. Why is that? And how can we tap into our ability to negotiate for others for ourselves? I discovered that by just sheer chance when I was a junior in college. So when I was a junior in college, I was introduced to computers. And the very act of coding opened up my world. I fell in love. Yes, I'm a geek, right? I totally fell in love with the act of writing code. So I was super excited when I heard that a local businessman in my little town was planning to start a computer training institute. I was convinced that computing would open up amazing opportunities for the kids in my town, that it would open up my town to new and amazing businesses or new ways of thinking about how to solve local problems. So convinced that I set up time to go meet this person and talk to him about using computing to change the town, to teach college students, to create new jobs, etc. And for whatever reason, he said, here, yeah, come join me. I was so focused on telling why it is good for others that I never paused to think about my lack of skills or my lack of experience or do I know all these things. Everything that holds us back, typically when you're negotiating for yourself. So let me challenge you now. What is the big thing that you have that you're trying to go ask next week, next month, in your jobs? Can we rephrase it? Can we reframe it? Can you reframe it in a way that you're thinking about it as benefit to the business, benefit to your team, benefit to someone else? Can you retell that story? Yeah? Something to think about. Now, fast forward. A couple months after I joined, the senior person on, on that institute left, and I found myself running the place. Yeah, I know. You get thrown into things, isn't it? And so, all of a sudden, I was thinking not just about coding, but about marketing the courseware, figuring out target segment, understanding cash flows. And suddenly, bridges were being built between tech and applications, tech and business. Figuring out how not only about knowing what your product is, but how to make it a feasible business. It also introduced me to my husband. Vivek walked into the institute to learn coding, and we got into a very big technical argument. <laughs> and then I learned that within three months, he was going to go to the US for further studies. And all of a sudden, just then and there, I had to ask myself, 
What do I do? What do I do? How does one compute this risk reward situation, right? How does one do this? How do you leave the comfort of a little town where you are sort of like a little big fish, you're running this institute, you're getting the strokes, on a whim that this guy is annoying and intriguing? <laughs> yeah? What do you do? What do you do? I decided I'll use what I learned in coding and create a pilot. So I applied for an exchange program and came to the US for a four-week exchange with Rotary International. I said, okay, let me go to the US, let's see what the country is like, let's see what's going on, let's see if the boy still is interesting, and then decide, <laughs> yeah? And so I landed in the United States in the summer of 92. It was beautiful on the East Coast. They say April showers give me flowers or whatever. It was a bloom. It was gorgeous. We, each week I spent with a different host family and their homes were gorgeous. They had white picket fences. They came in fancy cars to pick me up. I was like, wow, this is grand. <laughs> I could do this. The boy was still interesting. <laughs> so I said, okay, let me figure out how to come here. Small problem, I had no money, right? So I met a couple of professors, pitched them the fact that, you know, I've been teaching coding, maybe I can get an assistantship. And they said, okay. One of them thought it, he could sort of give me an assistantship. So armed with a letter that I would get an assistantship, I go back to India, six months of getting paperwork, get to the consulate, visa, etc. I land in the blizzard of 93. <laughs> no fancy cars to pick me up. No sunshine and blooms. I had never seen a tree with no leaves that was not dead. <laughs> I had never seen snow. And there I was with this passion that I was going to learn more computing, teach more computing. Right? I realized that my pilot design was completely flawed. <laughs> not only did I have no skills to figure out how to live in this country with, that was gray and white, I had no skills even to take care of myself. You have to understand, I grew up in an extended family. Everything was taken care of. Everything was taken care of. I didn't know how to cook. I, I, I thought clothes got cleaned by themselves. I mean, <laughs> bathrooms, you, do I have to clean that? <laughs> right? But I also realized that I did not have the skills to navigate. I did not have the skills to navigate. I didn't know how to ask, how to figure out. And so I took the time to really think about what are the places that I really need to focus on. And that experience I'm distilling into three points. One, every new world, and this doesn't matter, you don't have to go 10,000 miles to another country to do this, it could be just a new job. Every new environment has a way people communicate. You need to learn that unwritten rules of communications. Google is very data centric. If you don't have data to back it up, it doesn't work. Make sense? That's number one. So I learned that how I was saying, and some of my jokes were falling flat because nobody understood it. So I joined Toastmasters. I joined Toastmasters and really worked on being able to speak, speak up, speak up with very little notice. Yeah? Number two, you really need a guide. For me, thankfully, it was the assistant of my professor who was giving me this assistantship. She coached me about how to get basic stuff done. And that was number two, find a guide, find somebody who knows the situation. And number three, you need to have fun. It's amazing how much when we are overwhelmed, we put our heads down thinking it's problem solving. Find friends. Find something that gets your head up, shows you all the wonderful things that's inside of you. These skills 
have helped me make through countless transitions from a student to a software engineer, from a software engineer or over to getting an MBA, from an MBA to going to product management, from product management to where I am today. Today, as Karishma pointed out, I head a team that works with app and game developers globally, building bridges across technologies and cultures, helping people achieve their dreams on an amazing platform called Android through a distribution mechanism called Google Play. And every day, I'm amazed by the immense creativity and humbled by the opportunity to tap into it. So, standing in front of you, I am as excited as when I was a six-year-old with the Meccano set. Then, I was building make-believe bridges, but today, looking at all of you, I know we can build bridges that will defy gravity, that will defy rules, that will defy things that people have told us we cannot do. So I have one challenge for you. Before you leave here, I would like you to take the time to do three things. One, write down something that you want to accomplish in the near term. And figure out what bridges you need to build to get there. Do you know the rules of communication? Do you have a guide? Do you have somebody who can show you a different perspective? Number two, look around you and find at least one person you have never met and truly get to know them before you leave here today. Most of our bridge building is finding the next node in your network. And number three, be a little bit more aware about the people around you who are looking at you for inspiration. I know there are days, and I go through this every day, when you feel, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed, there's so much to do. But the very fact that you are here, you are light years ahead of most people out there. You're amazing, you're a role model, you're an inspiration, you're a bridge to a lot of people, to a better tomorrow. Thank you.